It was 9.30 on Christmas Eve. As I opened my front door and stepped outside, I smelled at once and with a lightning heart that there had been a change in the weather. All the previous week we had had thin chilling rain and a mist that laid low about the house and over the countryside. My spirits have for many years been excessively affected by the weather. But now the dampness and fogs had stolen away like thieves into the night. The sky was pricked up over the stars and the full moon rimmed with a halo of frost. Upstairs, three children slept with stockings tied to their bedposts. There was something in the air that night. That my peace of mind was about to be disturbed and memories awakened that I had thought forever dead, I had, naturally, no idea. That I should ever again renew my acquaintance with mortal dread and terror of spirit would have seemed at that moment impossible. I took a last look at the frosty darkness, sighed contentedly and went in to the happy company of my family. At the far end of the room stood a tree, candle lit and bedecked, and beneath it were the presents. There were vases of white chrysanthemums and in the centre of the room a pyramid of gilded fruit and a bowl of oranges stuck all about with cloves, their spicy scent filling the air and mingling with the wood smoke to be the very aroma of Christmas. I became aware that I had interrupted the others in a lively conversation. We are telling ghost stories. Just the thing for Christmas Eve. And so they were, vying with each other to tell the horridest, most spine-chilling tale. They told of dripping stone walls in uninhabited castles, and of ivy-clad monastery ruins, by moonlight, dank charnel houses and overgrown graveyards, of howlings and shriekings, groanings and scuttlings. This was a sport, a high-spirited and harmless game among people. There was nothing to torment or trouble me, nothing of which I could possibly disapprove. I didn't want to seem a killjoy, stodgy and unimaginative. I turned my head away so that none of them should see my discomfiture. And now it's your turn. Oh no, I said. Nothing from me. You must know at least one ghost story. Everybody knows one. Ah, yes. Yes, indeed. All the time I had been listening to their ghoulish, lurid inventions, the one thought that had been in my mind and the only thing I could have said was no. No, you have, none of you, any idea. This is all nonsense, fantasy, it is not like this. Nothing so blood-curdling and crude and laughable. The truth is quite other and altogether more terrible. I am sorry to disappoint you, I said, but I have no story to tell and I went quickly from the room and from the house. I walked in a frenzy of agitation, my heart pounding, my breathing short. I had always known in my heart that the experience would never leave me, that it was woven into my very fibres. Yes, I had a story, a true story. A story of haunting and evil, fear and confusion, horror and tragedy. But it was not a story to be told around the fireside on Christmas Eve.